When most people hear the Moors murders, they're very likely to think of the years between 1963 and 1965, when Ian Brady and Myra Hindley took five children out onto Saddleworth Moor in Manchester, sexually assaulting four and killing all five of them. But their case, even though it's quite unique in the sense that they targeted children, wasn't the only spree of assaults and murders that took place in and around a moor. Today we go across to Bremen, Germany, where a patch of land would become the scene of one of the most brutal targeted attacks on women the country had ever seen before or since. The Devil's Moor is the literal translation of the German name Teufelsmoor, and with a name like that you could almost say that the moor was always destined to be the site of some truly terrible crimes. But back when everyone around the area spoke Saxon, Teufelsmoor was once Doffesmoor, which doesn't quite mean the same thing as it does now. The moor part is very much the same, but the Doffes literally means less fertile or dead, which was basically the locals' way of saying that because of the thick peat that made up and surrounded the bog, nothing could grow there. So, the dead moor became the devil's moor, but either way, the women who unwillingly found themselves there during the 1980s probably thought that they really had encountered the devil. On October 30th, 1981, Britta Schilling was on her way home. She was only 18 years old at the time and was on her way back from a disco in Bremen when she heard a car behind her on the road. It was the 80s and just like the rest of the world, the roads and streets of Germany were no strangers to hitchhikers, so no one could have been that surprised when Britta struck her thumb out and asked for a lift. But unlike many before or after her, Britta never made it home that night. She was found on November 6th, naked, assaulted, her body showing visible signs of torture and dumped in the Devil's Moor. She had been stabbed about 27 times, one of those wounds leading to her death. Her discovery was a shock both to her family and the towns that surrounded the Devil's Moor, but no one thought that there would be more victims like her to come. Many believed that Britta's assault and death had been a one-off incident, and though her story was tragic, for the communities around Devil's Moor, life went on. Only three days after Britta had been discovered, another hitchhiker was out on the streets of Bremen, looking for a lift. This time it was a 17-year-old girl, not out in the middle of the night after a disco, but in the middle of the day and on her way home from school. She heard a car on the road behind her and stuck out her thumb, just like Britta had only a week or so before, and the car stopped. Inside was a young man, handsome and kind-looking, and when the girl asked him for a ride, he agreed to take her. The schoolgirl got in, probably thanking her luck that she'd managed to find a lift home, but the man took her out to Devil's Moor, where he showed her his true colours. The driver stripped the girl and he assaulted her, leaving her deep in the marsh without her clothes and taking them with him when he left. The girl was alive, but it was November and she was left out in the wind and the cold of the moors, trying to piece together what had just happened to her. It's not exactly clear why the driver left her alive or why he decided to throw her clothes out of the car as he drove away. Maybe some part of him felt sorry for seeing a young girl left like that or maybe he had his fill of murder 
from killing Britta, mm. but the driver did toss the girl's clothes back out onto the road. He scattered them around as he drove, making sure that she wouldn't be able to collect them all in one go, and that meant that he was long gone by the time the young girl had her clothes back and had managed to report the crime to the police. Her assault was not initially connected to Britta's. Britta had been assaulted, but she'd also been physically tortured and murdered, and the local authorities didn't think that the two cases were so similar, yet also so different, could have been carried out by the same person. But they changed their minds by December 3rd, when a 20-year-old woman came into the police station to report that she had just been assaulted out in Devil's Moor. Three similar cases in such a short period of time was enough to get the police looking at everything all over again, and they started re-examining Britta and the schoolgirls' cases, comparing them with this new one and hoping that the three together would bring enough evidence to the table to catch the man responsible for them. But law enforcement didn't have very much to show for it when 20-year-old Heike Schneer was reported missing in February of 1982. She hadn't shown up for her job in Bremen and her colleagues found that strange enough to report her as missing to the police on February 9th. But it would be a while before anyone actually found out what had really happened to her. On March 24th, Heike was recovered out in Devil's Moor, dead from over 36 stab wounds. Law enforcement now knew that the mysterious driver had struck again, but news travelled slowly and hitchhiking was still a huge part of life in Bremen. On May 22nd, 18-year-old Angela Marx was on the streets looking for a ride when an now all too familiar story would play out. She was reported missing, but it would be seven months before her clothing, handbag and skeletal remains were found on Devil's Moor. Because all they had were her bones, it was difficult to say exactly what had happened to Angela, but the investigators were certain that her death was connected to Britta and Heike's and the two other assault victims. And they only became more certain when two more teenage girls came in to report being assaulted out in Devil's Moor in July of that year. Both girls thankfully survived their ordeals, but their cases also brought more than a bit of bad news with them. As terrible as it is to say, an active killer and rapist is better for an investigation than one who's gone underground. More crimes and victims mean more clues and evidence, and it also increases the chances that the culprit will make a mistake and be caught. But after the two victims in July of 1982, the man who was plaguing the Devil's Moor went eerily quiet. The investigators were left with no new information and still no idea who he was or why he was targeting female hitchhikers. In some ways, both law enforcement and locals must have sighed a sigh of relief. With no new cases for almost a year, there was a chance that the attacker had moved on, or maybe even been arrested for an unrelated crime, and the streets did seem safer, but the driver was still out there, and he reminded everyone of that in June of 1983. On June 6th, he kidnapped a 17-year-old girl at Knife Point, driving her out to the moor, where he forced her to perform oral sex on him. Maybe this assault was enough for him to quench his thirst, or maybe he was only getting back into the swing of things because he let this young girl live. She reported the crime to the police, bringing with her the difficult news that the killer and rapist of Devil's Moor was back at it again, and reopening the investigation into him. But Martina Volkman wasn't as lucky. 
She was a 20-year-old woman trying to hitchhike from Veer, a suburb in Bremen, to Hamburg on December 26th, 1983, right after the Christmas holidays. She was found the same day, and after looking at her body, it wasn't difficult to piece together who had offered her a ride and what he had done with her after she'd gotten into his car. There were traces of semen in Martina's mouth, and she had been stabbed more than 100 times. Just what was the murderer of Devilsmoor doing? Why was he attacking these women, and why had he attacked Martina so brutally when he let others go? Even with Britta and Heike, the most he'd ever stabbed one of them had been about 36 times, and 36 is a long way off 100. The investigators feared that Martina's attack meant that things were only going to get worse, and they were right. Instead of going underground again, the killer waited only a couple of weeks to strike once more. On January 4th, 1984, he picked up another teenage girl and forced her to perform oral sex on him. He thankfully let her go without killing her, letting her report the crime to the police, but he struck again in February when he abducted a 20-year-old woman and did the very same thing. The woman survived, at least definitely proving that he didn't always kill his victims and he wasn't always going to be as brutal with his attacks as he was with Martina, but it did also prove something else. He'd gone almost a year before he attacked that 17-year-old girl and held her at knife point in June of 1983. Then he'd waited again and only struck in December when he'd assaulted and murdered Martina. There was always the chance that he'd had more victims in between who had either not been reported as missing or had maybe been allowed to live and simply hadn't reported their assaults to the police. But if those numbers were correct, that meant that the killer was now working on a shorter fuse. He'd attacked Martina in December, another teenager in January and another in February. And if that pattern continued, that would mean that the investigation would be looking at a new case every month. A chilling theory to come to terms with, but it was a theory that was confirmed when an 18-year-old girl stumbled into the police station in March with an all-too-familiar, terrible story to tell. The police must have listened with heavy hearts when the girl explained that she'd been picked up by a man in a car and taken out. To Devil's Moor, but things must have gotten only more difficult to listen to when the young woman went on to say that the man had told her that he was going to have sex with her. But it was after that that the young woman's story took an unexpected turn. The young woman had agreed to have sex with the driver, only asking for a cigarette to calm her nerves before they got started. The driver agreed, giving the young woman time to take out and light a cigarette as he sat in the car beside her and waited. Who can say what must have been going through that young woman's mind, and I'm sure not many of us can say that we would have had the courage to do the same thing that she did. But she took that lit cigarette and smashed it into the driver's face, catching him off guard and buying herself some time to get out of the car and start running. And who can say why the driver didn't get out of the car and start chasing her, or why he didn't start his car and drive her down? But he didn't. Maybe it was another twist of fate, or maybe he simply hadn't expected anyone to fight back. But he started his car and he took off in another direction, letting the girl live. In another collected moment of courage, the girl turned around, watching the car drive off and making sure she'd memorised the licence plate, and then she went back into town and gave it to the police. An investigation that lasted years by this point was solved when an 18-year-old girl handed the police the culprit's license plate on a silver platter and they were able to trace it back to a man named Thomas Rath. 
Thomas was only 24 years old himself, and he was a non-commissioned officer in the West German army, someone who certainly should have been able to keep his cool under interrogation, but the investigators had him only for a short amount of time before he confessed to everything. The murderer and rapist of Devil's Moor finally had a face and a name, and this time he wasn't getting away, only to strike again later. He was taken to court and sentenced to life imprisonment on April 28th of 1985, almost four full years after all of this had first started. Even after all of that, his motives for committing his crimes are still somewhat up for debate, but a provision was made to his sentence that required him to receive psychiatric therapy whilst he was in prison, at least implying that the court system believed that there was something psychologically wrong with him, but with a crime spree as brutal as his, that wasn't so hard for any of us to piece together by ourselves. <laughs> 